Hello, tomorrow. Welcome to Orbit 12.10. I'm Jade Kim. This is Jared. And today we are going to interview Joel Sircell of Momentous Space. And we actually have a, an additional furry bonus guest by the name of Scout, whom will take your questions as well. So kicking this right <laughs> off, Joel, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so diving right into it, can you tell us a little bit about what Momentous is and why Momentous is? Well, so what Momentus is, is a, it's a Silicon Valley startup that's doing in-space transportation services. So uh, if you think about like uh, what SpaceX does, what SpaceX does is two space transportation services, um, basically um, launching customer satellites into space. Um, the, the thing is that uh, satellites don't always want to stay where the rockets put them. Um, and we're really focusing on a market that the, ro that, that the rockets aren't satisfying too, too well, because rockets have a tendency to go into very specific orbits. And um, uh, the satellites need to get from the orbits that the rockets drop them in uh, to where they need to go. So that's what we do. Very interesting. So um, would you say then it's kind of like the connecting flight for payloads then? Yes. Yeah. So it's just like connecting flights. So um, the big rockets like the Falcon 9, the Falcon Heavy, the BFR, and then later on the Blue Origin, uh, uh, New Glenn, will carry lots of spacecraft into what we call standard orbits. Um, and it's a very cost-effective way to get into space. But once you get into space, you've got to get to, to the specific orbit that you want to go to. The other way, and, and so um, there are hundreds of small sats that are launched into space every year on piggybacks on big rockets to these standard orbits. And most of those small sats would like to go to other places. Um, and so what we do is we carry them to those other orbits. Now, there's also a whole bunch of small rockets coming online that will be able to take um, small sats to, to special orbits. But the, the small rockets are more expensive on a dollar per kilogram basis, and um, they can't go very high. So our vehicles will actually ride into space with our payloads, our customer payload satellites and spacecraft, We'll ride into space with them, connected to the rocket. When we get into space, uh, we'll disconnect from the rocket that carried us, and we will uh, take our payloads to their destination orbits. Very cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that that's an issue that um, you don't really think about every single day when it comes to, you know, launching different payloads. You think, oh, you know, strap it onto a rocket, put it into where it needs to go, and boom, voila. But it's interesting to think about that that's not always the, the vantage point or that's not always the ideal um, destination for these payloads. So Yeah, you know, the, you know, the issue is that historically what's happened in, in sort of the old space way is that the big aerospace companies would build satellites that had their own space propulsion systems on board. And space propulsion systems are traditionally very expensive, and they use up a lot of mass. And it's much more cost effective for forward leaning companies to work with us so they don't have to have their own propulsion system. They just attach to us using standard interfaces. And um, uh, it's much cheaper for them. And we can carry multiple satellites on a single vehicle and they'll drop them off each in their own custom orbit, sort of like a FedEx truck dropping off packages on its route. Yeah, and I kind of want to uh, ask, because we have a really good question uh, right out from Andy Law in our YouTube chat room, asking whether you guys sort of look at yourselves as a space tug or a kick stage, sort of like how how do you view um, yeah, we're, moving those yeah, around? Yeah, we're a space tug. A space Absolutely. Tug. We're, we're not a kick stage. We're a space tug. And, you know, um, so simple as that. And we're starting small. So there's a really big unmet need, and that unmet need is is created by uh, this new space revolution. You know, in 2012, there were only about 50 small sats launched into space in the whole, you know, on the whole planet. And uh, last year, it was about 300 small sats 
And our market projections show that within the next five years or so, it's going to be well over a thousand small sats are going to be launched in space every year. And most of those satellites are ride at, riding as pig, piggybacks on big launch vehicles. And those big launch vehicles are mostly just satisfying the needs of their big customers, you know, the, the big old satellite co companies and governments. Um, so there's a huge unmet market need. And um, so what we're doing is we're starting small with space tugs that uh, carry small sats and microsats to their destinations. Then we've got a roadmap that gets big real fast because the way we see the space industry is we see it growing very quickly, not only in the number of commercial satellites that are launched, but also they're going to get bigger and bigger over time. But we're really, you know, we're really a vision-based company. We've got a, a short-term business model that makes a lot of money, but we're really all about humanity's place uh, in space and where we're going as a species. Um, you know, uh, human beings are natural explorers. We settle new frontiers, um, and uh, the, the species new, needs this new new frontier of space. You know, there's uh, close to eight billion dollar eight billion. I'm sorry, there's close to eight billion people on the planet right now. We're still the population is still growing exponentially, and we see space as a as it's not just a new sort of business space. It's a new frontier for the species and the planet, and uh, uh, we see uh, industrial manufacturing moving into space. We see. Um, data processing, data farms, data centers moving into space. We see power production moving into space. So, you know, it'll grow from a few hundred billion dollars a year now to trillions of dollars over the next decade and a half or so. And so what we are is we're an enabling sort of backbone service for that new industrial revolution. Yeah, and we've got another question. You know, our chat room is just lighting up right yeah. now. Yeah, um, they're they're all just getting really excited about this. Um, and Revel is asking, what size payloads are we talking about, and how much is the deployer in weight? So, like, what what kind of size spacecraft are you talking? Because small sats, you know, they could be anything from like little cube sats up to maybe a couple hundred kilograms, sure. something like that. Yeah. So our first service is called Vigoride. It'll go into service early next year. And it can handle payloads up to about 250 kilograms, which can be um, collections of dozens of microsats, which are CubeSat size spacecraft, or it can carry a, a single 250 kilogram small sat. Um, Vigoride uh, will be for operation mostly in low Earth orbit, carrying small sats, microsats, CubeSats to their destination orbits. Uh, but very quickly after that, we go, uh, we start to grow rapidly. So Vigoride will evolve into Vigoride Extended late next year. And Vigoride Extended will have a delta V capability of six kilometers per second. So delta V is how we, we measure in space, you know, how fast, how it's, it's how fast you can go. But in space, that translates into what orbit you can get to. And if you get into low Earth orbit, and then you've got a delta V capability of six kilometers per second, it means you can go basically anywhere. You can go anywhere in Earth orbit. You can go to lunar orbit. You can go to near-Earth asteroids. And we, you can go to trans-Mars injection. So Vigoride Extended increases the payload capacity a little bit to about 300 kilograms. Uh, but then it, it makes it so we can carry customers anywhere. And then after Vigoride extended, we're going to grow to um, larger and larger systems. And our first really big system is Arteride. It's designed for satellites up to a few thousand kilograms. And after that, we go big with Ververide, which is um, really big satellites you know, up to 10,000 kilograms, Leo to Geo. So six kilometers per second of Delta V. That is, uh, yeah. that's tremendous. That's a lot. <laughs> how do you, uh, how do you yeah, guys... It is. How do you guys pull that off? Well, so um, we have a proprietary uh, propulsion technology. Uh, we talk about the fact that it's based on microwave electrothermal rockets, which use microwave radiation, the same kind of stuff that heats food in your microwave oven. Um, and the microwaves are used to heat water vapor to super high temperatures, significantly higher than the surface temperature of the sun. And uh, at those temperatures, the water vapor actually dissociates into uh, oxygen, hydrogen, and different 
uh, different chemicals of hydroxyls and, and that sort of thing. And we squirt that super high temperature gas and plasma out of the back end of the rocket to produce thrust. So it's microwave electrothermal thrust, or like microwave electrothermal propulsion with um, water as the propellant is our basic rocket technology. And then we've got a whole bunch of secret sauce and how the spacecraft is, is designed and how we do our missions okay. uh, that takes special advantage of water is an amazing substance It's um, in terms of its thermodynamics and its properties. And so we take advantage of that in really cool ways uh, to really have a revolutionary capability with these vehicles. So I have to admit, while I was doing some background research on this um, water plasma propulsion, I couldn't help but think how just plain old sci-fi this sounded um, because so all I could think of is like, okay, wait, so if I take a cup of water and I throw it in my microwave for like 20 minutes, like, am I going to get rocket fuel? I mean, <laughs> clearly not, but like the technology, it sounds so elegant and it sounds so um, like it's water. It's, it's one of the most abundant resources on this planet and you turned it into literal rocket fuel. Like that's just so amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, so water is a super abundant material in the solar system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what the planetary scientists have taught us in the last few decades is that uh, everywhere we go in space, we find water. You know, after the Apollo program, um, we thought that the moon was a barren desert without water. And subsequently, we found that there's water frozen into the craters in the lunar poles. And we also know that about somewhere between one in five and one in three near-Earth asteroids is loaded with water. And there's thousands of near-Earth asteroids that are actually easier to get to in terms of delta V than the moon. So there's lots of places in space where you can refuel with water. And that's what gets that's part of what gets us excited about water as a propellant. Another thing that gets us excited about water as a propellant is most rocket propellants are toxic dangerous, flammable, and require high pressure bottles like, you know, that, that operate at pressure levels uh, similar to a scuba tank. And that's a safety issue. So um, because we can use ordinary water that's just stored at, at room temperature and, and normal atmospheric pressure, it really reduces the cost of our spacecraft and reduces a lot of the safety issues that rocket propulsion systems normally have. Yeah, and, and there you go, chat room. Our chat room was asking, um, can you do, can you get it from asteroids to do it? So there you guys go. Uh, all those questions, like those 20 questions that popped up all of a sudden, uh, yes, you can. Um, and one of the questions from our chat room, too, from Lur was asking, you know, using water as a medium in your plasma engine, have you encountered any corrosion problems with, like, degrading performance, extended burn cycles? And, and if there are problems, how do you guys sort of work with those hurdles? Yeah, so um, uh, we, we heat the water so much that it actually dissociates into hydrogen and oxygen. And um, at the temperatures that we're operating, water is actually an oxidizer. So it will erode many common metals at these temperatures. So it's, it's definitely important for us to use metals that are, uh, to use materials in our engines that can handle extremely high temperatures and are oxidation resistant. And I'd love to tell you what those materials are, but it's proprietary. Yeah, as a, <laughs> as I imagine, a lot of uh, a lot of things with this would be. It still sounds absolutely amazing uh, that you guys are, are pulling this off and working on it. So, have you guys done like any? Well, we're super excited about it. You know, as as the CTO of the company, one of my jobs is to maintain our intellectual property portfolio, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. and we have a patent por portfolio that. Um, we patented all the solutions to these technical problems and, uh, and, you know, prove the feasibility of these approaches. And so in a few years, as we evolve as a company, we'll be able to talk about how all these, all the secret sauce of how our systems work in detail. Very cool. Well, I look forward to hearing about your secret sauce because, uh, this, uh, this is okay. like, I mean, just six, like, uh, how much water are you using to get six kilometers per second of Delta V? Well, um, uh, the um, Vigorite Extended System uses significantly over 100 kilograms of water, and the Vigorite System uses about 40 kilograms of water. 
as the vehicles get bigger, we carry more and more water. So mm-hmm. Arteride, which will carry, you know, uh, 2,000 kilogram class payloads, will will carry, you know, on the order of a couple of thousand kilograms of water, and operate at very high power levels. And from our chat room, uh, Dutta is asking, you know, what kind of power requirements does this engine have, and how do you supply that? And also, Kevin M um, from YouTube is asking the exact same thing as well. How much power does it need? Yeah, so the power demands of the system will grow over time as our systems grow. Our first mission uh, is called El Camino Real, and the flight hardware for that is completely finished and built and qualified and tested. And uh, that's a low power system that um, that uses, uh, let's just say, power levels that are smaller than the power levels in a typical microwave oven. And um, El Camino Real, we'd hoped it would be in space already, but the launch vehicle, the rocket that we're, that's carrying it into space has been delayed. So it'll be uh, launched in the May-June timeframe. And the purpose of El Camino Real will be to validate the technologies and approaches that we have and prove absolutely without a shadow of doubt that they work the same way in space that they do on the ground. And it'll also um, flight validate most of the technologies for our Vigoride systems uh, other than just the water propulsion system, but also avionics, software, all that kind of good stuff. Um, Vigoride will operate a little higher power level than El Camino Real. And then our first multi-kilowatt system is Vigoride Extended. And then um, as we go down the roadmap to higher and higher power systems, uh, we, we get uh, pretty substantial power levels in the tens of kilowatts and uh, later in the hundreds of kilowatts. Wow. Well, that's pretty impressive and like really exciting. Um, and I can't help but wonder, or I really want to ask. So, okay. So you st- you you started Momentus, and it's it's doing all these amazing things. But can you talk a little bit about your journey to um, and before starting Momentus? Um, you you have a really interesting history, and I was wondering if you could kind of touch on that just a little bit. My personal journey. Um, well, sure. In aerospace. Oh, sure. Yeah. Personal um, aerospace. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been I've been a space geek since I was about 12 years old, and uh, I got very excited about the future of humanity in space when I was a kid. And uh, I read a lot of science fiction, but and also engineering books. And uh, I was really excited about um, a vision of humanity's uh, spread through the solar system. That was articulated by a guy named Professor Gerard O'Neill, who was a great physicist at Princeton. And he wrote a book called The High Frontier and started an organization called the Space Studies Institute. And he basically proved the scientific and engineering principles that that show that um, it actually makes more sense for human beings to live in space than on the surface of a planet. Um, There's enough material in the asteroid belt to build beautiful Earth-like worlds with a carrying capacity of about a thousand times the carrying capacity of the Earth. So think in terms of a trillion people living in comfort and uh, in in environments of their choosing, ecological environments with trees and parks and lakes and streams. Um, And these worlds can be fabricated out of asteroid materials and um, as humanity grows in population, they can spread throughout the solar system. And the basic fundamental scientific feasibility of that, as well as a lot of the economics of it, and the engineering was actually worked out in the 70s and 80s by Gerard O'Neill. That got me really excited uh, when I was a kid and uh, caused me to go into the space business. Um, but, but the thing is, O'Neill assumed that it would be cheaper to get into space than it has been in the last 50 years. Because remember, the space shuttle was supposed to be a low-cost way to get into space, and it turns out it wasn't. So O'Neill's vision uh, wasn't fulfilled on the schedule that he projected because he projected that um, because it didn't make sense without low-cost access to space. So what got exciting in the last several years is that it, it really does look like SpaceX and Blue Origin and some other companies are going to build commercial systems that really fulfill the original vision of the space shuttle. 
for low cost, easily reusable vehicles that go into space. That's what's really exciting. Anyway, so as a kid, I got excited in space. Um, I did my undergraduate degree in engineering physics, so I'm really kind of a physicist. And then um, I went to work for JPL in the early 1980s, and I immediately got involved in advanced space propulsion there. So, and and over uh, over the time of my career at JPL, I took over NASA's advanced propulsion research program. So I led that up. Uh, and then I became uh, the program manager at JPL for all the spacecraft technology at JPL. And while I was working at JPL, I did my PhD in, at Caltech in mechanical engineering and, and uh, in applied plasma physics for space propulsion. Um, and that was cool, and I enjoyed it. But space was moving a little slow in those days. So in the early 00s, I left JPL and went to work uh, full-time as a researcher at Caltech and um, started my first company, ICS Associates, uh, which was a consulting contract engineering company. And I had a client at, uh, at uh, ICS Associates that asked me to review uh, what SpaceX was doing and recommend whether that client should buy a rocket from SpaceX. So at that time, I had a chance to really roll up my sleeves and work with the SpaceX team and see how their rockets were working. And um, my recommendation to the client was, yes, you should buy their rockets. And boy, is this exciting because they're going to have low-cost reusable rockets in just a, uh, a matter of a few years. And so in about 2011, I, I realized that space was going to get exciting, the way Gerard O'Neill saw it. And I thought, that's awesome. What's the most important thing I could be working on that would help humanity's future in space? So I started Transastro, which is a company that's developing the technology to mine rocket propellant and water from asteroids. And um, this brilliant investor and physicist named Mikhail Kokorich, um, who is a Rus Russian ex expatriate living here in the United States, uh, co-invested with NASA in TransAstra because he saw the potential of asteroid mining to really uh, create a fantastic new uh, vision for humanity and an awesome opportunity that so that we could build factories and hotels and uh, you know settlements in space. And um, Mike and I were working together on, uh, uh, you know, that's really cool, and the technology that Transaster is developing is really cool. But what do we could do in the near term to help this happen? Uh, you know, as a venture that is highly investable by the investment community, and can really help today's businesses grow and flourish faster. And that's where the idea of Momentus came from. And that's where the idea of, of water plasma rockets came from. And, uh, and then he's just, um, he sees how businesses uh, can uh, be formed and create new, whole new business areas. And so he, um, you know, he went out and worked with the investment community raised initially $8.3 million in seed funding. I think our, our total funding that the venture community has provided now is about $9 million. And uh, we've staffed up to about a dozen full-time employees. Our total team is approaching 20 people. Um, we're an American uh, company um, developing the technology and creating the jobs here, but we're in, we sell internationally. Um, and uh, things are taking off, and it's fantastic. We have um, we have about four hundred and twenty million dollars of letters of intent from customers to buy our services over our roadmap, and um, we've publicly announced six million dollars in confirmed committed sales of Big Ride and Big Ride Extended. Um, uh, and and our first customer there is a is a European launch integration. A company called Exolaunch, and we will be announcing within the next uh, week or two uh, another confirmed uh, sale of about six million dollars, which, which gets our um, uh, which gets our total sales up to about twelve million so far. And then there'll be a bunch more that we'll be announcing in the next few weeks and months. So we're we're going gangbusters. <laughs> we built our first flight hardware. We're, we're going to have Vigoride uh, ready early next year for commercial services. We will be flying in space this summer, absolutely, no question. Uh, when that Soyuz goes, we'll be ready to go on it. 
And um, Vigorite Extended is going to open the solar system uh, to uh, small commercial activities and uh, and governments that want more cost-effective commercial partnerships. We're very excited about public-private partnership with NASA. You know, NASA has really seen the light. They've seen that this old school thing where you contract with big aerospace companies and everything takes decades and billions of dollars <laughs> is not the way to go. And um, they're really partnering with industry in new ways, and they deserve a huge amount of credit for that. You know, SpaceX as a company wouldn't be where it was without the partnership with, with uh, NASA. Mm -hmm. There are other companies that are partnering with NASA in very powerful ways. Um, and so this is all good. And um, I, I got to tell you, it's just so exciting and it's moving so fast. I can't even believe it. Yeah, and Scott Herod uh, on our YouTube chat actually is kind of asking something um, that I was wondering about, which is uh, talking about you know your power plant. Is it going to be able to operate very far from the sun? I mean, could you do outer solar system space exploration? And I mean, you guys, your fuel's water, so you don't have to worry about like keeping it cold for long periods of time or something like that, like you would with like a like a regular cryogenic upper stage. So you guys, are you, is Momentus thinking about going even beyond Mars and be, maybe beyond the asteroid belt? We'll take our customers where they need to go. And um, our, our services can launch spacecraft on interplanetary trajectories. Um, you know, after Vigoride extended, we'll have the Delta V capability to launch spacecraft anywhere in the solar system. Um, our, you know, typically solar panels are highly effective out to maybe the orbit of Jupiter or so. After that, you need to go nuclear. Um, uh, but uh, the, for the transportation service where we get our customers on the trajectory that they need to be, they need to be on, we're good to go. Very cool. So we can we can we can help NASA send spacecraft anywhere. NASA, ESA, anyone else who wants to do deep space ac exploration, we can send them on interplanetary trajectories. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, I know. There's a lot of talk at NASA of late about maybe using small sats uh, to s sort of like swarms of small sats to start doing exploration. And it sounds like you guys are going to have a leg up on the competition of being able to enable that. Yeah, absolutely. The way that we work with microsats, you know, spacecraft in the say one to ten or twenty kilogram range, mm -hmm. is they we carry uh, standard CubeSat and microsat dispensers, and even our first system Vigoride will be able to carry dozens of CubeSat scale microsats and drop them off each in their own custom orbit, and they'll be just dispensed like any CubeSat. Um, and Vigoride will be able to do that, uh, you know. So, for example, the Vigoride Extended System will be able to carry multiple, say, uh, 12 to 16 U microsats into low lunar orbit, right from low Earth orbit, on the basis of a low cost launch. Uh, so, this is a revolutionary capability, and there's all kinds of exciting science that you can do about the moon prospecting for water just from you know, CubeSat scale microsats right there in, in low Earth orbit. Um, Vigoride Extended will even be able to carry small landers into orbit around the moon, and then the landers will be, go, be able to go down to the surface. And Arteride will be capable enough to carry big landers to orbit around the moon. And together, Arteride and Vigoride Extended allow lunar sample returns oh, wow. uh, in just a, just a handful of years. Wow. Whoa, that's- As a commercial service. So mm -hmm. NASA will be able to contract with us to deliver payloads to the moon, uh, just like they would contract with FedEx. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, you know, I was going to say, NASA's doing that sort of like lunar COTS program right now. Are you guys, are you looking at sort of uh, trying to get in on that? So we think the lunar COTS program is terrific. And if we had some partnerships in there, we wouldn't talk about it publicly right now. Uh, gotcha. <laughs> okay. So Got it. Clear as so, day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I, echoing your sentiment from earlier in the interview, um, I really love and respect that this kind of all stemmed from a passion for 
kind of like democratizing space and the way of the future, like you said, it truly is. It's a public-private partnership and it's truly a global collaboration. So given that, with all of the amazing capabilities that your company is going to be um, providing, what are some of the things you're really excited about on the immediate horizon and a little bit more distant into the future in terms of um, not only like research capabilities, but for um, the company, for Momentus overall? Well, I mean, we're excited about everything that Momentus is doing. Momentus mm -hmm. is a transportation services company. So um, I really like the way Jeff Bezos talks about this. So, so Jeff has pointed out that um, college students working from their dorm room can start software companies that you know become unicorns and become billion dollar companies right now. And that's been the capability for a long time. But it's really expensive to start. It's really expensive to start a multi-billion-dollar company in the space business right now, and part of that is because it's so expensive to get into space in the first place. And but once you get into space, then you've got to go somewhere. And so then, and so it combined with low-cost reusable launch vehicles, um, our in-space services are part of the infrastructure, sort of like the internet for space that will make it so that it'll be inexpensive so that you can you know you can start building microsats and cubesats basically like a garage application the way Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak started Apple you know sort of at that scale and build a company that can scale to be a you know multi billion dollar company so that kids can do that so the key what's what's most exciting about this is that we're making space affordable for the little guy. And we're making it so the little guy can build a company that scales and goes nonlinear into space. That's incredibly important. And that's where the space frontier opens up and goes completely nonlinear. And as that happens, then you'll see massive uh, data uh, services in space. You'll see power stations in space. You'll see space tourism, you'll see, see dozens and dozens of other types of businesses starting in space that will then launch humanity into space. So that this is a very, this is, I literally can't think of anything more exciting than this. We are very, momentous is a very practical near term, you know, company with a business plan that gets to, you know, large cash flow and profit early. But we also have a very strong vision for the future. And you know, this is so much more important than a business. Let, let me just put this in context. So the, the way that I like to put it is, in the last five billion years on Earth, there have been four or five important events. One, the first event was, you know, a, a couple of billion years ago, the first life emerged on Earth. That was a that was a you know his you know that's beyond historical. I'm talking about events that are more important than history, right? So life occurs. That's a big deal. And then um, you know a fraction of a billion years ago, the first eukaryotic life, you know, like that has the type of cells that we have, emerged. That's a big deal because now life could become complex and diversified. Okay. And then a few hundred million years ago, the first animals walked on land. And then we had to, and then, you know, that's a big deal. Okay. And then a few million years ago, the first really intelligent animals started to develop stone night, you know, stone tools and conquer fire. And that was a big deal. Um, so in terms of, you know, things that are far beyond historical importance, we are at the frontier of something far bigger than anything that's happened in human history. And that is, in the history of life on Earth, one of the things that you observe is that life always moves forward, becomes more complex, more capable, and it fills its ecological niche, and then it leaps into the next ecological ecological niche. So now it's like um, the spores of Earth are going to be carried 
by humanity into space, and we will and we will be t- and life, not just humanity, but life from Earth will be making the great leap into space. And by making that great leap into space, it gives a potential for the human population over the next thousand years to grow to a trillion people and humanity to spread throughout the solar system. And at the end of that time, we will have vehicles that will be capable of traveling between the stars and spreading throughout the universe. So what we can see is a vision of life from Earth having unlimited potential, immortal in its scope, uh, the ability to expand and learn in a dynamic way. So that's, that's, this is beyond historically important. Now, that vision is very important because what it tells every human being on the earth is that there are no limits to growth and that your children and their children and their children can all have better and better lives with unlimited potential to develop their minds and, um, and explore intellectually, emotionally, culturally. Um, and that positive energy will energize people to do better in everything they do and, and create an even more positive spirit here on the earth. So, you know, in a very deep sense, Momentus is a country, is a company that has a vision of humanity equipped with everything it needs to travel throughout the solar system to expand and grow. Our mission is to make that happen. Um, so, so there's nothing more exciting to th- than this. End of statement. There's nothing more exciting than the space adventure that Momentus is part of. Goodness. Well, you've certainly sold us. That was uh, captivating, to say the least. <laughs> um, so where can our audience go to find more information and more news about uh, Momentus and all the amazing things it's going to be pursuing? So um, we have a, a nice website that people really, uh, that we get a lot of positive feedback on the website. So I'd recommend that people go to www.momentus.space. We're not .com, we're .space. Um, and, it, and Momentus spelled, the, it's spelled like the word Momentus, except the last three letters are T-U-S. So Momentus.space. And there you can see um, a, a, vis- a video that shows the near-term vision for the company. Um, and you can read blogs about our company strategy, our team, and that sort of thing. Um, there's, uh, and soon we'll have a really cool tool that you'll be able to go to that website and you'll be able to, it'll be like Expedia for in, in space rides. You'll be able to pick what orbit you want to go from, what orbit you want to go to. And, uh, oh, there's our video playing. That's cool. So, um, then we're also, um, active on social media and LinkedIn and, and, uh, Twitter and that sort of thing. And, uh, so check it out. Well, thank you very much. Um, Well, Joel, thank you so much for joining us today and um, teaching us all about Momentus and um, this incredible technology, uh, water plasma propulsion. I still can't believe I'm saying that out loud. Um, So I know we're all really excited to see the capabilities and to see all of the fantastic things getting launched into space and into new places, new destinations. Um, But before we say goodbye officially, I, of course, have a very lovely thank you I'd like to give to our Escape Velocity citizens. These folks contribute $10 an episode on Patreon, as well as our Orbital citizens, my favorite people, uh, as well as everyone else I'm going to be mentioning, $5 an episode. Uh, And (laughs) Suborbital, yes, the names are getting smaller. These folks uh, dedicate $2.50 an episode. And last but certainly not least is our Ground Support citizens. I will sing so that you can try to find your name on that wall of text, because all of these folks contribute contribute a dollar to two dollars and 49 cents per episode on le patreon if you would like to become a supporter of tomorrow please head on over to www.patreon.com slash tomorrow and contribute whatever you see fit and uh, if you don't want to donate monetarily that's totally cool simply share the show with your friends and your family yeah. uh, smash that subscribe button hit that thumbs down up oh, shoot definitely don't hit the thumbs down <laughs> unclick the thumbs down click the thumbs up Share us with your friends. Yeah. Subscribe. Send Tune us in. snacks. All the snacks. 
but make sure so. they're not perishable. And we will see you uh, every Saturday for Tomorrow Space. And on that note, thank you for tuning in, and we hope you have a lovely rest of your week. Thank you.